morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are pleased to welcome you on behalf of the G Environment and the G Research who jointly organize this panel on exhaust and non-exhaust emissions, uh, focusing in particular on traffic and transport. Our distinguished uh, experts are toxicologists, neurobiologists, emissions experts, and they will help us understand this very daunting and serious problem. One point before we start, uh, this is an interactive panel. We want you to join our conversation. Please do so by uh, using uh, the slider tool. And we just launched the first of a series of polls to get to know you better. Now, going back to the panel today, our video just uh, um, introduced today's topics. To put it very bluntly, the punchline is that pollution kills, but not all sources of pollution are the same. In fact, all fine and ultra-fine particles are dangerous, but they are not equally dangerous. And their impacts on human health is also very different. Particles can vary uh, in mass and composition and in size. Our experts today will present uh, the results of EU and non-EU funded research projects and uh, give their insights into the relative contributions of uh, indicate, uh, to pollution indicators and different health impacts of various sources of pollution. Uh, the last point, why do we focus on transport? The answer is simple, uh, because transport represents the main source of air pollution in cities for some kinds of pollutants, such as, for instance, ultrafine particulate and nitrogen oxide. Now, the slide is closing. Maurizio Maggiore from uh, DG Research is going to comment on it. Thank you. Good morning from Brussels. Let's uh, see what is the main, uh, uh, let's say, composition of the uh, of the audience. That was a little bit the uh, the task of um, the purpose of this uh, of this poll. You can see it on screen. Uh, unfortunately, I have some problems in the reading, but I see that mostly is uh, uh, expert uh, in the environmental area. Uh, and then, uh, uh, sorry, it's uh, not coming uh, full screen, so I don't see it uh, fully. Maybe yeah. Abe, you can you you see it better. I I try. So, I see that we got uh, uh, citizens who are interested clearly because this is a very important and sensitive uh, problem. There are media uh, representatives, and I have to say, Maurizio, and you uh, also uh, uh, agree on that. I know that this is a topic that is not really well known because not many people, except for experts, understand the differences between different uh, particles and different kinds of pollution, and that's exactly what we're going to discuss today. Exactly. And now we're going to uh, give the floor to our first expert. Uh, she comes from the Netherlands and Dr. Miriam Herlofs Nederland is uh, coming from the Center for Sustainability, uh, Environment and Health in the National, uh, uh, the National Institute in the Netherlands, as I said. She specializes in the assessment of adverse health effects of air pollution. She's got a strong focus on related, traffic-related air pollution, and she will introduce and kick off the panel giving a general overview. Please. Yes, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. And indeed, my presentation uh, on hazard ranking of particulates from different sources uh, will be uh, a more introduction of the topic we're discussing uh, today. Um, there are several sources that emit components and as such contribute to air pollution. Examples are mobile sources, industry, livestock, wood smoke from heating our homes, but also natural sources like volcanoes and wildfires. These sources emit particulate matter, PM, an important air pollution component that differs in shape, size, and composition. Uh, and as the composition of those emissions differ, no source is the same, and also the health effects of those sources are not the same. Mainly PM10 and PM2.5 particles with an aerodynamic diameter smaller than 10 or 2.5 micrometer are regulated by the European standards, but smaller particles below 0.1 micrometer 
might, from health perspective, be even worse and therefore good to consider for regulation purposes. Those smaller particles could translocate from the lung to the blood and affect other organs. They could go directly to the brain through the olfactory bulb. And as they are so small, those ultrafine particles are not easily recognized by macrophages, which uh, is uh, our defense system in the lungs. In addition, more substances, both from chemical origin and biological origin, can adhere uh, to ultrafine particles if you compare it to the larger particles because the surface area uh, to which these other substances can bind is bigger. However, for regulation, the mass and not the surface of particles is considered, and increasingly research shows that mass may not be the right metric if health is the starting point. Exposure to air pollution, as we've seen in the video, is associated with uh, many health effects like respiratory and cardiovascular effects, but also effects on the brain and the reproductive system. Yes, um, epidemiology and toxicology are two disciplines that can be used to examine the health effects of air pollution. With environmental epidemiology, the disease patterns in the population in relation to environmental factors like the air pollutions are studied and several methods can be used. Uh, in this type of research, also databases, uh, data sets are used with the advantage uh, sometimes if you have, a, for example, a mortality database, that new data collection is not necessary and pol policy questions can be answered relatively quickly, both on a national and local level. In my previous slide, I showed you that there is a huge variation in what is emitted from different sources. Still, despite the huge side range and the variety in chemical composition, epidemiology tends to observe the same risk coefficients across the world. And with a toxicological approach, on the other hand, the toxicity of the specific components and the mechanisms that will lead to the observed effects can be examined. For this purpose, for example, in vitro studies using cells, in vivo studies using animals, and also human volunteer studies can be performed. And especially the hazard is considered with those studies, and PM size and composition are important hazard factors. However, if we want to know the risk that we run, the exposure, the duration, and the dose must also be taken into account, and even whether we are more sensitive to air pollution, for example, due to our age or underlying disease. Um, yes, uh, I would like to show you two examples of hazard screening. The first example is an in vitro study uh, with the hazard of engine exhaust is examined. Um, uh, uh, on collected PM from an engine running on diesel or 50% biodiesel with or without a particulate filter, a DPF, and both under rural and urban driving conditions, as the conditions which, uh, on which we drive are also important. And the toxicity of those particles was examined by measuring the oxidative potential, of which we will hear more from uh, the next speaker, uh, and that is on, directly on PM, but also the cell toxicity after exposure of cells to the collected PM. We observed differences in oxidative potential expressed on a per mass base uh, uh, and on a uh, per driven distance, uh, taking into account the PM emission rate. Um, we, we show a more clear reduction with the DPF uh, using the uh, per distance driven uh, expression uh, due to the low PM emissions rate of DPF. And looking at the release of IL-6, which is an inflammatory marker per distance driven, that's the table on the left, it is shown that the application of the DPF had a beneficial effect. More driven kilometers are needed to observe the same effect without the DPF. Uh, however, the use of, of B50, which is 50% of biodiesel, resulted in a much greater potential to induce release of IL-6 compared to uh, vehicles fueled with fossil uh, diesel fuel, uh, irrespective 
of a DPF application. So this study showed that PM mass reduction achieved using D50 will not necessarily decrease the hazard of engine emissions, while the application of a DPF has a beneficial effect on both PM mass and uh, emission and PM hazard. Uh, our study published in inhalation toxicology is an example of an in vivo hazard screening. PM from different sources was collected and re-aerosolized to expose animals at different dose and the health effect, mainly the inflammatory response, was examined. Uh, the PM that was collected uh, from the several sources as shown in the table. Uh, and I would like to um, uh, put a focus on the, the four different brake pads from which we collected PM material, uh, a low metallic brake pad with copper and the same metallic brake pad without copper, as copper is expected uh, to impact our health, uh, and two nano-based uh, brake pads uh, were used for collection of PM. The health effects were examined 24 hours after exposure, and the figure in the middle is an example um, that shows the outcome of a benchmark dose approach for the total amount of inflammatory cells in the lungs and the neutrophils, which are important cells of our defense systems. With this approach, the hazard of PM is ranked, and the less particles needed for an effect, the more hazardous those particles are. An indication for a higher hazard of wood combustion and breakware emissions, and then mainly the now uh, containing brake pads, was observed compared to the other PM sources, but not taking into account the poultry farm. Dr. You know, Hadloff's uh, Nayland, I'm sorry, but we have to stick to the schedule. We really have 50, 60 seconds left. Okay. Um, then I will go to my last slide. Uh, I don't see it. Yes, I see it on the screen. Some considerations for, for air pollution policy. And I think uh, the most important one is that we should look uh, in which metric should be used for regulation, um, that we look at source-specific risk in, and combine not only the hazard, but also the exposure, and be aware that if the emission is reduced, that it can also result in increased toxicity. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for your very, very uh, general introduction. And I'm sorry for interrupting you. The next speaker is um, Dr. Um, uh, Kaspar Dellenbach of the Paul Scherer Institute in, the, in, the, in Switzerland, who's going to take, uh, uh, to start from, uh, to pick up from your considerations and analyze uh, uh, one of the uh, health impact mechanisms you mentioned, which is oxidative stress. He also going, is going to uh, present results of his research which has, already, which has recently been published in the uh, leading scientific journal, Nature. Uh, if I may, just a second, uh, uh, I would just remind uh, the, the audience that there's a possibility to put questions in a Q&A by Slido, and that we have a second Slido poll uh, open to, to get a feeling of what you think and know about the subject. Thank you. Dr. Wallenbach, please. Thanks a lot for the introduction. I'm waiting to see my slide going through. Yes, so very welcome from Switzerland. And I would like to start right off with what my colleague just presented. So in brief, we are looking at particles in the atmosphere. And these particles in the atmosphere have a wildly different composition. They are either emitted as particles, then they are called primary particles, or they can be formed in the atmosphere from gas phase precursors and both anthropogenic and natural sources contribute heavily to this burden. And we are now looking into what could drive their potential health effects. What I'm gonna present is not the effort of myself. We as a joint team from many European institutes looked into the sources that could have uh, rather high impact on human health in Europe. And if you would like to see all the details of our study, you can refer to this published article. Um, particle mass or particle matter has severe impacts on human health, and it's largely evaluated based on the mass concentration. 
Um, this has practical reasons and works fairly well. And what we see here is that in urban centers where the pollution is enhanced, but also where a large fraction of the population lives, the highest fraction of the mortality burden occurs. However, there could be factors and properties of the particles that could modulate the health effects of these of this type of pollution. And the oxidative potential is one that has been put forward. The oxidative potential, and I will call it OP sometimes, describes the ability of the particles to oxidize molecules in the body and thereby harm and make us sick. And now this OP depends on the chemical composition of the particles, which is in turn defined by, to a large degree, the emission sources. What we see here now in the figure is that when particles do not have a high oxidative potential, even an increase in the particle mass concentration does not lead to an increase in, let's say here, the heart attack um, probability. However, if these particles have a high oxidative potential, the risk of heart attacks strongly increases. And that shows that we should indeed be looking at what is driving the particles oxidative potential in Europe. And this is what we did in our study. We took four steps. First, we looked at the particles chemical composition and the oxidative potential through chemical analyses at several locations throughout Europe. Then with statistical approaches, we investigated and quantified the particulate matter sources, both their chemical composition as well as their spatiotemporal variability in terms of concentration. Then in combination with, of these time series and the oxidative potential variability, we identified what drives the oxidative potential at these receptor sites. And what is more important, we also quantified how much oxidative potential activity per PM mass each source has. Then in the last step, we combined these findings with output from an air quality model. So we took spatial fields of, let's say, traffic emissions throughout Europe and then calculated what the oxidative potential concentration of the sources. And with that exercise, we then found that indeed the particle matter mass concentration and its oxidative potential have in Europe a rather similar variability. However, the sources wildly differ. The, ma the mass concentration is driven in the south, mostly by crustal material, so dust, and in the north of Europe by um, secondary inorganic aerosol, which is driven by combustion emissions that also include the mobility sector and industries. On the other hand, the oxidative potential of these particles is driven most of the places by organic material that is emitted from anthropogenic sources, mostly residential heating, and formed then particles in the atmosphere. In addition, mostly in the urban environment, vehicular wear emissions play an important role. So here we are not speaking about exhaust emissions, but rather about the non-exhaust emissions that occur from braking. And this now means that even if mitigation strategies are successful at reducing PM mass concentrations, this might not necessarily reduce the oxidative potential of the power. In the following, then we investigated what emission sources dominate the population exposure to PM and OP. And as a large fraction of the population resides in the urban space, traffic emissions gain further importance. In this exercise, we used the fact that we performed the analysis of OP using three different tests. While there is a variability between different measurements of OP, the same set of sources are found to be important. And this highlights the robustness of our finding. When grouping further Europe into um, areas with similar population density, so we, we now distinguish rural from urban spaces, we found that the urban population is not only subjected to higher PM mass concentrations, but very possibly this material is also more toxic because it has a higher oxidative potential per mass. This puts a clear focus on where 
we should be investigating air pollution. Lastly, I would like now to finish by looking at three open questions. And while this study has focused on a specific year, 2011 here, it remains unclear how OP levels will evolve in future. PMS concentrations will further decrease across Europe as its main precursor emissions are reduced thanks to the successful mitigation strategies. However, the non-exhaust traffic emissions as well as residential heating emissions weren't substantially reduced and this would then um, imply that also the oxidative potential hasn't been reduced. Even if we focused in this study on Europe, in principle, our approach could be applied anywhere. In essence, we could even try to get to an, a global assessment and really look what the global population is exposed to. On the long run, I also believe that we should focus directly on linking these different PM sources and formation pathways to the health effects directly and thereby figure out what is really mattering for the health effects that the population is subjected to. And with these open questions, I would like now to conclude, and I'm very much looking forward to your questions. And if you would like to team up with us, you actually find my email address and you can contact me there at any time. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Dallenbach, Maurizio. What, what about the results of the, 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 the slide, I, Paul? Um, I see here that uh, we have a, a quite uh, equal or similar uh, importance given uh, to the various sources, except for the secondary particles. Uh, exhaust uh, seems to be still a, a bit uh, slightly higher, but uh, I must say that the number of respondents is quite low. So I think this is, uh, maybe we keep it on a little bit longer just to see uh, more, uh, more answers, because of course with nine, uh, uh, it's easy that these numbers are, are quite uh, similar. But at the moment, they are almost rated at the same level. Thank you. So I, Dr. Dallenbach was talking, was speaking about, uh, as well as uh, his predecessor, uh, break uh, uh, emissions, emissions from breaks. And this is um, interesting also in relation to the next speaker, uh, who is Professor Andrea Remuzzi from Italy, from Bergamo, uh, a, a very nice city which became uh, in, uh, in famous way famous because of COVID. Uh, Professor uh, Remuzzi is going to discuss the results of a EU-funded project, Low Braces, showing uh, the toxicological impact uh, of PM, which depends not only on the size, uh, but as it is already clear, also on the chemical composition of the particles. And he's going to discuss breaks because low braces has developed and designed a kind of break, which has not only reduced the particles by 50%, but also made them non-toxic. I mean, those particles are non-toxic. And lastly, unfortunately, that's why the, uh, the reference to uh, COVID is going to uh, give an insight into possible end connections between uh, the relationship between pollution and COVID mortality. Please. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure for me to present uh, our uh, main data that have been produced uh, using an European project. And uh, the results was uh, a collaboration between uh, industry and uh, research institutions for addressing the problem of the toxicity of the um, particles produced during breaking. And um, I'm going to show, oh, I'm sorry. What I'm going to show here is that um, this, our project started using a bench test uh, to produce the particles of a non-formulation of uh, brake pads uh, and disc. And this uh, was able to uh, reproduce uh, the production in a very controlled way. What we have done during, during this uh, DynaBench test was to collect uh, airborne particles and also non-airborne. And uh, we then started to do some uh, laboratory tests on uh, human cells and on uh, organic uh, uh, and environmental uh, living systems. 
I will concentrate in this presentation the results on uh, the effect of particles on uh, human cells, but uh, we also find uh, similar results uh, on uh, the environment of these microparticles. And for the human cells, what we have done was to use uh, uh, lung cells, especially the uh, cells from uh, the alveoli that are uh, uh, exposed to the uh, smallest uh, uh, particulate size. And uh, what uh, we have seen is that um, basically the formulations that uh, we started with, uh, they were kind of toxic to these uh, uh, alveolar cells, uh, the cells that we called uh, A549 cells. And um, you see that uh, increasing the concentration of these uh, uh, particles that uh, have been uh, 2.5 uh, uh, microns in size and less, we see a decrease in the cell viability. And uh, when we arrive to more than 500 uh, micrograms per milliliters, all the cells are almost uh, uh, not viable. But you see that the last formulation that uh, we obtained uh, Professor Ramuzzi, we don't see, I think, the slide you're commenting. Yes, yes this one. The last formulation that uh, uh, we obtained is uh, not toxic at all for all the concentration that uh, we tested. And uh, this is very important because um, there is something different in the composition of the particles because the size and the quantity was the same. And uh, you can see that uh, the same result uh, was obtained when uh, we study the apoptotic function of the cells. You know that when the cells are not happy to live in an environment, they undergo apoptosis, they just suicide. And you see that the cells that uh, uh, were exposed to the previous formulations, the one in uh, the red and uh, gray bar, they develop a lot of apoptosis when uh, we increase the concentration of the microparticles. And then we see that the last formulation just uh, didn't uh, develop apoptosis in these cells. And this is an important uh, aspect of um, the cell response to the particles. And also we have seen that um, there is a, a massive uh, change in uh, the mRNA expression of uh, different uh, pathways that are related, made, related mainly to cell, um, uh, to cell proliferation and also to the oxidative stress and to cell inflammation. You see, for example, the expression of uh, IL-1 and IL-6, uh, these interleukin compounds are known today because uh, they have been uh, much increased and uh, uh, they are involved uh, in uh, the COVID disease. These cells uh, exposed to these particles, they develop uh, a massive increase in uh, the mRNA expression of uh, these uh, compounds. But the last formulation, the uh, FMBBV7, just uh, did a very small increase in uh, mRNA expression. And also, we have seen some uh, uh, production of uh, a compound, the hemooxygenase compound, that uh, is a pathway that is related to oxidative stress. And the last formulation didn't produce uh, too much uh, oxidative stress. So basically the results of our study are summarized uh, in uh, this uh, slide. What we have seen was to demonstrate that uh, the reduction in the toxicity was also combined with the reduction in the production of the particles by this break formulation, the last one that uh, we tested. And uh, we did some numerical analysis to show that um, also, if uh, we are uh, uh, simulating the amount of particles inside of the street in a uh, central city like Milano, we see a lower distribution of the particles inside of uh, the main street. And uh, what we have done was to compare this uh, uh, concentration and to try to simulate what happened to the lungs when some people are living in these streets and uh, when these particles are arriving inside of uh, the lungs. And uh, by this uh, numerical uh, analysis, we have been able to demonstrate that uh, the particles, they arrive in a lower way, in a lower quantity in uh, the bronchial and in the alveolar space. And uh, we estimated that uh, 
it is a necessary that the person uh, breathe continuously this uh, PM 2.5 for five or seven years in order to have the same concentration that in vitro we demonstrated are, are for, for uh, the alveolar cells. So we are kind of uh, uh, confident that uh, these particles are not uh, uh, too toxic to the people that live in uh, these cities, but uh, continuous breeding of these particles may induce some uh, toxic effect. And the question here is, uh, what is the cause of this toxicity? What we have seen, as you see here in, the, in this slide, is that uh, we compare the toxicity of copper to that of the particles. So what we have done was to take uh, the same uh, copper concentration of the parts, particles that uh, we have tested, and uh, we show that there is the same solubility Pro loss. Professor, I'm sorry. Yeah. We are really closing. <laughs> I'm closing and I just want to mention that uh, this, uh, the presence of copper is uh, the most important uh, uh, chemical that is uh, responsible for the toxicity. But uh, I want to uh, end my uh, presentation mentioning that uh, these uh, uh, particles may also be in, uh, important for uh, the uh, disease uh, that uh, we have experienced that is the COVID-19. And especially, um, I want to mention the fact that uh, there is uh, uh, experimental evidence that uh, the COVID-19 is more related to areas that are polluted. And the mechanism of this uh, is the fact that um, we have... Uh, okay. I guess that I can go run to the end. We have evidence that um, there are the same derangement of uh, uh, the pathology that is induced by the COVID to those that are uh, uh, induced by exposure to uh, particulate matter. And especially there is uh, the possibility to increase uh, all the inflammatory response and uh, the oxidative stress uh, that uh, is induced by the COVID-19 when uh, people are uh, exposed uh, to PM particles. So in conclusions, I would like just to make... Uh, uh, I think the, that... Mm. The conclusions. And uh, in this way, we may have the possibility to concentrate our attention to the particle emission, but especially to the particle composition in order to understand their toxicity. And uh, for this, I thank you and uh, I will be available for uh, taking some questions. Maurizio about the poll. Yes, uh, just to have a look at uh, what's evolution uh, up to now, if uh, it can be put on screen. I don't see it. Can we have the results of the poll? Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a, a second poll that we launched about uh, other uh, areas. And we see that uh, the audience is uh, concerned more. Again, seven answers, so not a lot of uh, statistic uh, for wood heating. And I think that's uh, justified according to some results we've already seen. And uh, uh, lower for radiation and energy generation. So uh, thank you, we, let's go ahead. Very interesting presentations until now. The next speaker is Professor Kamminen, uh, who comes from Finland, and she will be discussing uh, uh, specific impacts of the finance particulate on health, uh, 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 on human health. And uh, those particulate and these particles are in the nanometer range. And uh, while normally uh, the most known effects of uh, uh, particulate uh, are on the respiratory and cardiovascular uh, systems. She focuses on uh, neurological diseases and Alzheimer for which there is uh, uh, an observed link between uh, pollution and uh, the, the, the insurgence of this, uh, this illness. She also is leading uh, a consortium. She's part of a consortium uh, uh, that is addressing these issues under a European funded project, which is called TUBE and started in 2019, please. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. 
So um, I will go straight to, to the topic of discussion. So as was mentioned, it's, it's been known for years that exposure to air pollution can have uh, significant uh, impacts on the lungs and the cardiovascular system. But now we have mounting evidence uh, that showing that uh, exposure also has adverse effects on the central nervous system. Um, what is important to note, of course, is that these neurotoxic outcomes can be um, influenced by a variety of different factors, such as age. Uh, it's been shown that particularly children and, and um, pregnant uh, women and, and the fetuses can be particularly vulnerable to air pollution impacts. On the other hand, the elderly and people with existing medical conditions are also uh, impacted in a different way when we compare to young, healthy individuals. Uh, there are also some evidence showing that gender and, of course, the presence of other environmental exposures can also impact on how a person deals with exposure to air pollutants. Now, um, with regards to the brain, it's already known that some of these particles can enter the brain, but it, um, it kind of depends on both the chemical and the physical characteristics of the particles in terms of the route that they use to reach the brain. Um, one of these proposed ways in which the particles can enter the brain and then impair the functions there is the olfactory epithelium at the upper uh, nasal cavity. It's also been shown that uh, it's possible to have this lung to brain transport so that from the systemic uh, circulation, the particles can enter the brain via uh, crossing the blood brain barrier. And of course, then the induction of systemic inflammation, for example, from the lungs can have impacts on the brain because the tissues in the human body are constantly in connection and communicating with each other. Now, um, the majority of these studies have obviously been done in rodents, um, and there are several already showing the adverse effects of exposure to ultrafine particles. And consistently in these studies, it's been shown that exposure impacts on the behavior of the, of the animals. So there are memory deficits, there are behaviors in these animals that resemble anxiety and depression. Then if we look at the brain and the pathology that's present in the brain in these exposed animals, there's clearly oxidative stress, there is neuroinflammation manifested as the overactivation of the cells in the brain that are responsible for the inflammatory responses. And again, also neurogenic alterations have been described. So this means that the particles can impair the birth of new neurons that is known to happen in the adult brain. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, it seems that there are certain populations that are particularly vulnerable to uh, air pollution exposure, and one of these is children. So there are several studies showing that exposures already in utero or during the early life can lead to striking changes in brain structure and function, and, and these can be also linked to diseases that occur later in life. And, and some of the reasons why children are particularly vulnerable are the fact that, of course, children spend a lot, of, a lot more of their time outdoors than adults do, so they are exposed to higher levels and more. Uh, but then children also have a higher breathing rate and, and they are consuming more air. And, and finally, especially with regards to the brain, it's been shown that children and, and very young, um, young uh, babies, they have less developed physiological barriers to block the particle entry. So this means that they are more heightened risk for the air pollution effects. And there are several papers that have shown that children that are living in highly polluted areas uh, have poor performance in cognitive testing. They show some behavioral deficits. And strikingly, they, when, when the, the brains of these children have been uh, examined, it's been shown that they actually display pathology that's similar to Alzheimer's disease, which is quite scary because Alzheimer's disease is generally um, a disease of the elderly and you have this accumulation of proteins uh, that is abnormal. And then you are seeing the similar things in these children that are highly exposed. Now, um, with regard to how UFP exposure is then linked to brain disease, 
Obviously, the world population is steadily aging and dementia is a major public health concern. Um, a lot of these diseases affected by aging are sporadic, which means that both environmental and lifestyle factors can have a huge impact and, and are risk factors for these brain diseases. And, and as was mentioned earlier, there are epidemiological studies now that are linking exposure to dementia. And I won't go through the details, but there are both structural and functional differences and changes and related to Alzheimer's pathology in individuals who are living in highly polluted areas. Now, even though this information already exists, we still need detailed mechanistic insight into how these exposures are affecting brain cells. As I said, it's a relatively new field of study. It has only been in recent years recognized that the brain is also impacted by these exposures. So we really need more information, more data on what happens, how it happens, and how we could potentially um, stop the adverse effects from happening. And this is the project that I want to then briefly mention. It's a European Commission funded project that has been now running for about two years where we are really trying to understand how ultrafine particles are affecting the brain and what is their connection to Alzheimer's disease. And this is a big consortium with several partners all over the world. And, and the, the main point is to try and understand better how these very small, very fine particles are then having impacts on the brain. And just to briefly show you what my group is doing in this project is that we are particularly interested in this olfactory area through which it is proposed that some of these particles can gain entry to the brain. And what we have done is that we have taken exhaust from modern diesel engines using two different fuels and, and taken cells from living individuals, living donors of the olfactory area and exposed them to these uh, ultrafine particles. And what we clearly see is that even short-term exposure to, to relatively low concentrations is affecting the oxidative stress response in these cells, indicating that these cells are really vulnerable to these uh, ultrafine particle effects. And as I said, this is, this is a running project. It's been going for about two years now. So we are expecting in the coming years to have really uh, detailed information on the impact of these particles on the brain. So I want to just finish by summarizing uh, and saying that there is already mounting evidence to demonstrate the harmful effects of ultrafine particles on the brain, but we really need new information on the cellular and molecular mechanisms in the brain. And obviously this increased knowledge uh, is especially needed for uh, human risk assessment and setting these limit values. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, Maurizio, what is coming up is that there is basically a growing scientific evidence hinting at complex mechanisms that can have serious impacts and costs, social and economic. What is your take? Well, uh, I think we are looking at many ways uh, in which these particles can have these uh, worrying effects. And uh, I think the last, the last presentation is clearly saying that uh, in the case of the ultrafines, we have basically no, uh, no way at the moment uh, uh, to regulate that. So the, the zero pollution strategy has uh, put uh, a stress on monitoring, uh, for instance, and I hope that these will uh, become a bit more uh, closely watched. Thank you. In fact, uh, this is linking into uh, the next, the upcoming presentation. And after that, there will be a couple of questions also for uh, Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Herlovs uh, Nayland. Uh, because one of the objectives that the Commission is probably is pursuing is uh, finding ways to regulating, as Maurizio was mentioning. And uh, from Ukraine, Professor Klimenko is presenting an original approach and methodology for uh, assessing the toxicity of aggregated emissions. Uh, which could be a different way to regulate road transport and indeed in general transport means. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, is it possible to see my presentation? Oh, here it is. Thank you. Uh, I uh, would like to be a conscience. Here we are uh, talking about uh, our efforts to understand priorities of future regulation in the field of automotive emissions. There are a lot of approaches uh, and 
around the world established now in uh, mostly incompatible way. Here, we are thinking about a comparison of aggregated toxicity of different type of vehicles. And regarding the methodology, uh, next slide, please. How to, oh, thank you very much. Uh, the methodology is very simple uh, and robust. Uh, aggregated emissions are calculated based on mass emissions of uh, well-known pollutants, uh, representing, uh, representing real emission in based on the methodology of European Environmental Agency. Uh, and this mass emission is multi emissions is multiplied on relative toxicity of each known pollutants corresponding to carbon monoxide. In such a way, we can compare different technologies in present and future in efforts to understand what is the most uh, precise and efficient way to regulate in the field. Some results, please next slide. Thank you. Uh, here you can see an example of uh, contribution of different pollutants to aggregated toxicity of petrol powered passenger cars. Here we can see that, uh, for instance, uh, nitrogen oxides become less important in favor of uh, uh, such components as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and persistent organic pollutants, uh, haldehydes, ketones, and aromatic hydrocarbons and another species uh, with uh, uh, cancerogenic effect. This uh, results gives uh, understanding of what uh, priorities can be in future to regulate uh, automotive emissions. Next slide, please. Curious example for diesel powered uh, passenger cars and for instance, diesel powered urban buses. Here we can see again that uh, uh, thankful to uh, latest standards, I mean Euro 6 norms, we have uh, lowered con uh, contribution of nitrogen oxides, but again, uh, a big share of total toxicity is regarding uh, components such as uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and in persistent organic pollutants. This uh, gives us understanding uh, regarding future standards, not only for automotive emission itself, but regarding uh, requirements for uh, fuel, for motor fuels. Next slide, please. Uh, in such a way, we can compare between each other different type of vehicles technologies and uh, emission level or, or different standards that an emission. Uh, comparing not only European based uh, approval, approved vehicles regarding European norm bus norms, but produced in North America and so on. Here we can see that uh, aggregated toxicity of petrol power powered vehicles uh, may be most reached the theoretical potential or limit for further improvement. And here we can uh, compare uh, internal combustion powered vehicles with electrical vehicles. And it gives for us understanding uh, the future when we will uh, take uh, Euro C, uh, C, uh, uh, seven norms and so on. And uh, the last slide, please. Thank you. Uh, based on the uh, above mentioned approach, it is developed the concept of state regulation. We are going to implement it in Ukraine during the next two years in efforts to establish a unified system of road vehicle labeling and uh, covering uh, all, all the process of uh, life cycle uh, regulation, starting from vehicle production, from vehicle process of choosing vehicles by uh, customer and uh, using environmental uh, low emission zones in the cities 
everybody uh, within a common system. Here you can see uh, levels of uh, so uh, call it uh, dynamic environmental hazard level and appropriate uh, zones of the cities is different color and this system is dynamic including age of vehicle including results of periodic technical inspection including uh, such uh, approaches as retrofitting vehicles in use to uh, enhance in, its environmental properties and so on. And uh, such uh, examples of tables is only a part of general system of regulation covering also... Um, Professor I... Klimenko, I'm sorry. Yes, okay. And the last slide, please, uh, regarding, regarding uh, some sources for further reading, if you are interested in the details of our concept of what we are going to implement in Ukraine. Thank you very much for your attention. That was very interesting, and this is a topic that concerns us all. I would say that we go and uh, answer a couple of questions from the public. Uh, I would like uh, Dr. Uh, Heilov Neyland to answer first, and Dr. Dahlenbach as well. This is about breaks, uh, two questions about breaks. One is from Federic Mongolan. Uh, I hope the pronunciation is correct. Do tie wear particles have the same oxidative risk as metal particles uh, from brake dust? How big are these risks uh, um, in inhaling, inhaling tire dust compared to braking dust? And something similar on brake emissions should be priori prioritized, as Samuel Flückiger, uh, uh, to reduce the health impacts of air pollution. So please, your floor, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, if I understand the question correctly, it's it's how uh, what the health impact of the different wear emissions uh, will be, uh, and I think we should test that because um, uh, which I didn't have a chance to show was from the the two different brake pads, one with and one without copper. Uh, they had a similar uh, health risk in our study, and we saw that the wear of the the brake pad with uh, without copper at a higher wear. So that means that you have more particles that you are exposed to. And like I showed you, the, the risk is not only the hazard, but it also you should take the exposure into account. So it means if you have a higher uh, wear, uh, so higher emissions, then you will, and the, the hazard will be the same, you will have a higher risk in the end. Dr. Dahlenbach? Um, I might just add that also based on epidemiological studies, some of our colleagues have found that in proximity of highway or of streets, the risk or, or like the health risks increase compared to the population that is a bit further away from streets, which could also so suggest that there is an impact of very big particles, which relates directly to the mechanically so break and tire wear particles as opposed to the exhaust ones and what we what we have found is as the colleague just before said the metal content is very important and i would strongly support um, what she suggested as an initiative to really investigate the, um, the emissions of different brake pads and braking systems overall that would have been actually one question if you had suggestions about the regulation, but uh, we might, if we, there is time, we'll get back to that later. To Professor Kanninen uh, about the nanoparticles and apart from the effects on the brain, does the two project already produce results, uh, has results on nanoparticle health impacts on other organs? Yes, thank you for the question. So in the two project, in addition, even though the focus is on the brain, there are partners who are checking how the impact goes in the lung. So, um, as I said at the moment, we are we are just completing year two, and we have now established highly physiologically relevant 3D models to study these effects in human cells. So, as thus far, the project has mainly been focused on on establishing these better um, modeling systems so that we can relate the findings that we have to to living individuals. 
And at the moment, we are starting to just generate results also for the lung. So please stay tuned uh, for our, our publications and you can also follow our website for the latest information. I think now uh, the, the, the floor would be to, uh, uh, for Maurizio Maggiore from DG Research to uh, give us some insights about the closing remarks. Uh, well, maybe I, I would take uh, uh, the answer uh, for the question, for the first question. Overall, uh, uh, I think the, the one of the questions was, uh, how do you rank them? And by the way, we asked also the, the public to, to, to give a ranking. So what, what would be your take? Uh, uh, what results, uh, what uh, data do you have, at least to put a kind of uh, uh, stress on uh, the importance of, uh, of the two main uh, non-exhaust uh, emissions? Uh, can you be more, uh, let's say, precise and more, uh, then we will see what the public thinks after the session in the slider. So should we comment? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, based on our analysis, the metal, so the break, the emissions related to breaking are more important to the, than the pads or tire or let's say tire wear. However, in our analysis with um, 24 hour aggregates, the spatial and the temporal variability of these two emission types are, is fairly high. So it's hard to distinguish, but okay. nevertheless, the brakes are according to us more important than the tires. Okay, then I, I can just uh, introduce the fact that we have just uh, uh, selected a project on, on tires. So uh, in the next years, we will have all these, uh, we hope, we'll have all these answers uh, uh, looked at. And also there was a question on, uh, on the impact on, the, on water uh, organisms. Uh, of course, uh, uh, I think the, the speakers were more on the air side, but uh, there is an intention also to look uh, at that. Um, I think we had the, the, the Slido, uh, uh, the last Slido. Uh, yeah, no, the, 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 the poll, just to see where we ended up with the poll. But anyway, the, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, now we have 11 questions. Uh, uh, Basically, the, the answer, sorry, uh, again, the exhaust is uh, more, the brakes uh, are higher than the tires. So basically, <laughs> there is an agreement also from, from the public and, uh, and the secondary is there, but uh, uh, less important. And maybe uh, I can also say that we also will launch a project on secondary particles uh, uh, in, in the next call. So uh, we will also have a look at that. So I would take the occasion to thank all the participants uh, uh, and the public for the interaction. And uh, I hope that uh, we have given some scientific evidence for future uh, uh, regulation. And uh, there were questions also on uh, uh, citizen science. Yes, I think there will be uh, also uh, topics on that uh, to try and have a, a more detailed uh, look, even though uh, the importance of the, se the session has highlighted the importance of what the particles are. And unfortunately, just measuring uh, uh, masses doesn't uh, give the whole message. So I think it will also be very important to look at the legislation from the emission side to try and reduce the, the, the share of the more dangerous particles. Thank you, everybody, and uh, have a good continuation of the Green Week. Thank you, all the speakers. Bye bye. Thank you.